Hi, everybody. My name is Jeremy Agor with the College of Engineering, and welcome to today's College of Engineering virtual brown bag um, speech talk. Um, we're happy to have uh, Bill Swope here today. He's going to talk to you about the benefits of hybrid geospatial data. But first, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you have questions during the talk, if you go to the upper right hand side of your screen, you'll see a little uh, question mark in a, in a little box. That's the Q&A um, box. Any questions you have, please go ahead and type those in right now or during the during the presentation as, it, as the case may be. And we'll get to those at the end and make sure that we try and get as many of those answered as possible. It's a great way for us to or you to interact with Mr. Swope and it'll be a, a lot more uh, a lot more fun, a lot more interesting that way if, if you guys are actually taking advantage of that opportunity. The other thing is if you all if you look at the um, Q&A box right now, you can see the link to the COE virtual brown bag schedule for all the rest of the semester. I encourage you to look at that. There's a lot of stuff coming up for the next few weeks and uh, we're hopeful that it's going to be interesting and helpful for you guys as well as for us. So without further ado, let's get going. Uh, Bill Swope, CP, is the Geospatial and Survey Business Development Manager for Half Associates here in Richardson and a certified photogrammetist through the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. Bill has been in the photogrammetic grammetric industry for over 13 years and is experienced in all aspects of photogrammetry, including compilation, planometric data collection, map editing, aero triangulation, and QA, QC procedures. Bill is also experienced with both aerial and terrestrial based LIDAR acquisition and post processing, as well as having a proficiency with small unmanned aerial systems and data processing using structure from motion. He's an assistant director with the professional practices division of ASPRS and a state representative for Texas for ASPRS's Mid South region. In 29, Bill was voted the Geospatial Professional of the Year by the Texas Society of Professional Surveyors. So now that you know a little bit about Mr. Swope, I'll turn it over to him. Bill, go ahead, please. All right, thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, hopefully everybody can hear me OK. And uh, I want to thank everyone at, uh, at the uh, Arlington campus for having me uh, online here today to talk to you all and to Ron Smith, uh, especially Ron's been uh, uh, very helpful with everything and uh, has been a great friend and a good friend to have as well. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about some geospatial uh, uh, data collection um, and some processing today. So I'll try to keep things uh, a little bit uh, um, undry and keep uh, the conversation going here so that things don't get boring for you all. Um, but as you all might know, um, currently geospatial um, data collection is becoming uh, quite the big thing in professional services. Um, and it's, it's something that's saving a lot of time and a lot of money for people. And so we wanted to go over some of the benefits of uh, what you can get from the different uh, methods of the different uh, geospatial data collection. Uh, and Jeremy did a great job of telling you a little bit about myself, just a, a quick informational uh, slide about me. So um, he mentioned the CP there. That means uh, I'm a certified photogrammetrist. Um, I'm number 1604. There's not that many of us. I've had my uh, uh, CP since 2016. We're probably in the 1800s or 1900s right now. Um, but it is something that a lot more people are learning about as um, the geospatial services start to expand and um, people learn more about uh, what we're doing. Um, so we're always looking to talk to folks and it's uh, uh, nice to be here today with you all. Um, so a little bit about what geospatial services are and some of the services that we offer at Half Associates. Um, we'll start with photogrammetry. And uh, photogrammetry, um, we do that in a number of different ways at half. And, uh, and we're, we're one of the few firms in Texas that are getting to all the different realms of geospatial data collection. Uh, so we um, provide a photogrammetry through manned aircraft um, with a digital camera system or taking the photographs, uh, or also with LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging, um, or a laser pulse um, shooting out from the, the belly of the aircraft. Um, we can also do both uh, photogrammetric data collection and LIDAR data collection with um, our drones, or our small unmanned aerial uh, systems. Um, we provide mobile LIDAR services, um, and the picture on the bottom there in the slide that you're seeing is our mobile LIDAR system, a Trimble MX-9, um, and that's just driving along the road and, and collecting data with LIDAR. We also do terrestrial scanning. Uh, we've got an example of the terrestrial scanner there. 
Uh, and we're also getting into uh, bathymetry or hydrographic surveying, which is getting on the water to get um, information about the, the surface underneath water. Um, and something that, again, is uh, more prevalent probably in, in federal type projects, uh, but um, is also used along state borders in surveying. So what are the benefits of hybrid geospatial data? Um, and uh, we probably should uh, you know, take a step back from that and even talk about what is hybrid geospatial data. I've got some examples here of just uh, uh, data sets collected from the various different types of data collection methods that we have for geospatial. Um, so hybrid data or, or data fusion as it's sometimes called, um, it generally just refers to you know, a process of combining different data sets um, or different ways that we've collected the data. Uh, into one data set that is more detailed or has you know, more information than all those ind individual sources or data sets would have. Um, and then it gives you a broader picture of what you're looking at. Um, and we're using it more and more as um, the, the different types of data collection the technology has advanced. And one of the key benefits of this and one of the processes that uh, is a part of all of, of this uh, hybrid data sets is data mining, um, particularly for um, agencies of all types, whether federal, um, you know, state, county, uh, right down to the local level, uh, municipalities. Um, I've got just a listing of some of the different types uh, of um, uh, or uses for the data. Um, and this is just a partial list because depending upon the data collection method, um, th there's probably a lot more than what I've just pictured here. Um, but a prime example of this is where um, we'll drive our mobile system down a street uh, uh, to provide uh, topographic mapping, um, usually for a development project, you know, road widening um, or an extension of a road, that sort of thing. Um, and they can use that for design. Uh, but at the same time, we can also use that, that same data that was collected and just repurpose that data <clears throat> and provide um, ADA compl compliance, um, pavement inspections and analysis. Um, and other things like sign inventories or tree inventories. You know, as we're driving past the road uh, uh, with a mobile LIDAR system, uh, it's got a certain width that it's going to scan out to. And so anything within that width, it's going to collect. Um, and if you go into the project and plan the project out properly, um, set the appropriate control if control is needed, um, you can provide data for a number of different projects um, with one pass or one data collection. Um, now, so what we do with hybrid data is we'll expand that a little bit and we may drive the mobile LIDAR system down the street, but we may also fly it with uh, one of our drones to collect data from an aerial perspective, whether that's just um, with photographs or with LIDAR. Um, and then at some of the intersections or if there's areas where there's um, uh, large amounts of uh, utility infrastructure or, or roadway infrastructure, we might also use uh, our terrestrial scanners as well. Um, again, it's just going to give us a, a, a more full idea of what's going on in the area. Um, but the nice thing about it is, is that once we collect these data sets and put them together, like I said, they can be repurposed and used for different things. So you don't have that added expense of having to recollect that data. Um, and you can use that data at a later date. Um, we have a lot of projects which we call can and scan, which will go out and collect the data because they want to have that information from that point in time. Um, and we'll just hold on to that data or we'll give them that data to the client to hold on to because they're going to use it at another time. Um, in many cases, when we're doing something like that, we're going to going back for a second pass and collecting data to compare data sets as well. Uh, but data mining is something that I always like to bring up because um, as we talk to more and more clients about, you know, using hybrid data and geospatial data in general, we always bring that up because you can accomplish a lot more. And I uh, wanted to get into some of the reasons why we use hybrid data sets, um, other than just giving us a big picture. Um, because there's reasons um, uh, that those different data collection methods have or issues that they might have that warrants bringing in a, a different type of collection method. Uh, one of those is angle of incident, and I've kind of listed them all here for you. Uh, there's footprint, footprint perspectives. When we're using a, a different type of data collection method, we're going to see different things, right? And then there's things that we can't see through, like there's just general obscurities as you're driving along the road, which can include cars um, or vegetation. 
And then also we're looking sometimes just to get utility captures. And so there's different methods that are, you know, particularly a little bit better or more suited uh, for one type of utility over another. Uh, so one thing to talk about here is the angle of incident. And two examples that I have up there is the angle of incident for um, an aerial acquisition and for a, a laser scanner on the right. Uh, so the aerial is on the left uh, as you look at the screen and lasers on the right. So when you're flying something, um, with, uh, whether it's with a drone or with an airplane or a helicopter, it's obviously going to be up in the air. It has some elevation to it already. And so that's going to factor into what you can see on the ground. Um, and if you add in a little topography, as is uh, part of the little example there on screen, and you're getting a little bit of elevation to it, um, you might preclude some of the areas that you can actually see because of that. So over on the right, we've got a laser scanner sitting there right down on the beach next to the ocean, and then looking at uh, some of the cliffs that are rising uh, to the right of the beach there, um, where uh, something in the air might not catch some of that angle of the cliff, um, a laser scanner will. And so you might have to have a couple of setups, um, but you can generally um, use that angle of incident with different collection methods to ensure that you get all the information that you need. Uh, another um, thing to take into consideration, and particularly when using um, aerial acquisition, is the footprint that you're going to see or the, the, the area on the ground that you're actually going to see. So depending upon the accuracy that's needed for the project that we're looking at, uh, we might choose a, an airplane over a helicopter uh, or a helicopter over a drone. Uh, drones are better for smaller projects. Helicopters are good for long linear projects. Uh, manned aircraft, when you're talking about airplanes, is really good for large scale projects, very large areas. The reason is because of the footprint that, that we have with an airplane. An airplane is going to be flying higher to collect the data, so it's going to see a larger part of the ground. It's just as simple as that. With a drone, you're flying it much lower to the ground, you know, generally between you know, 125 feet to 400 feet in that range. And so again, the area on the ground that you can see is going to be limited just due to that um, height perspective. So that's another um, thing that we take into consideration when we're looking at different data sets and why we might choose one uh, type of data over another for collection or uh, multiple data sets to use. Uh, another reason for this are just general obscurities or line of sight issues that we get. And this can pertain to not only mobile LIDAR, as I've got an example up here for you, and to terrestrial LIDAR, but also for aerial, when you're flying uh, uh, something in the air, um, there's going to be things on the ground that are going to obstruct what you can see on the ground, uh, just like there are if you're driving or you have a scanner set up on the ground. So what I have up here to, for you to look at is an example of a, a mobile LiDAR project. On the left is the Google Earth Street View, so you can have a, a, a picture of what's actually on the ground. And then to the right, the scan that we took um, driving our mobile system. And so one of the, the key features that you might notice there that might obscure or have a line of sight issue is that uh, a wall that's running alongside the road there on the right side or the east side of it. Um, and in, in which case, we're not going to be able to necessarily see that when we drive down the road with our mobile system. So we can go over to that uh, part of the, the road there or the part of the sidewalk area and set up a terrestrial scanner and collect the, da the data that way and then combine it with the data set that we get from the mobile system. And so what does that do for you uh, is illustrated here in the little uh, uh, imagery or graphic on the right. So the, the blue data, or it's uh, mostly blue here, hopefully you can see that um, uh, online. The data to the left um, is of that barrier on the left side of the barrier where the mobile LiDAR system was able to see it and collect data. To the right, and it's kind of an orange or a red uh, data set, is the data set that we collected with the terrestrial um, LiDAR system. And so we're able to then get both sides of that barrier and get uh, past that uh, line of sight issue there by using just two different types of data collection that we put into one hybrid data set. The vegetation and other terrain issues. We kind of already talked about one terrain issue, you know, when you're flying a, from an aircraft and you have a little bit of a hill, uh, you're not going to see all of that hill, so you can use um, a terrestrial based LIDAR to catch that. But when you're flying from an airplane and looking straight down, you've got a, a big group of trees. Um, it can sometimes be very hard to get data through that uh, group of trees, especially just using traditional photogrammetry or photograph. Um, LIDAR is good at getting through a lot of different um, types of tree canopy. Not all of them, but it's good on a lot of them. 
And I've got an example of what uh, the number of returns or the returns that, as a LIDAR goes down and hits the ground, what it's going to see. So there's a number of returns that will be sent back based on what the, the, uh, the LIDAR, the laser pulse is hitting as it goes down. Um, and so the, the, the back um, graphic there, the green with the white on it, is an example of two data sets, one with uh, using photogrammetry or photographs and the other using LIDAR. The green is the photogrammetric data set and you can see when it hits the tree canopy, it stops there and you don't get any further data underneath it. Um, and the example sort of to the left of the screen here, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving there or not, um, but you can see some of the white underneath the green or a good amount of white underneath the green there at least. And so that's where the LIDAR was able to penetrate that canopy and get um, data uh, right down to the ground. So in many instances, when we do have a heavy tree canopy, we can fly it with manned aircraft or with a, a drone and still cut through a lot of that uh, tree canopy and vegetation using LIDAR. And then I also mentioned utility capture is one of the things that we take into consideration uh, when we're looking at a project and we're deciding upon which um, type of data collection is going to be the best to use. Um, I've got some examples here of power poles, but we collect this data any number of ways, um, principally by using terrestrial scanning methods, but we can also catch a lot of this um, uh, with a, our mobile LiDAR system driving it down the road. Um, however, it's a little bit better to use a terrestrial scanner to get up when the, the power poles and the lines, which if that's what we're trying to concentrate on, are a little bit higher, is that a terrestrial scanner uh, can be used to put a little bit closer to the area that we need it at and just gets a little bit better data. Um, so again, just a, a, a small example of what we might use to collect a different utility uh, over one other type of utility. Um, and by the way, using drones or manned aircraft to get utility markings is a great way. Uh, again, you know, just using the photographs, photos worth a thousand words, is a great way to, to capture those images of the project area uh, and to bring that back into everybody that needs to see it. And then I always uh, want to mention control when I'm talking about geospatial data collection, whether it's um, with terrestrial scanning, a mobile LIDAR, or any type of aerial acquisition. Um, when I first uh, was introduced to LIDAR back around 2007 or so and started working with it as a photogrammetrist, um, there was a lot of talk that, you know, LIDAR is going to come in and it's going to you know, wipe out the need to have ground control. Because ground control can be an expensive for any project. Uh, but the fact is, even with the, the advances in technology that we've had, particularly in the last couple of years, ground control and ground truthing are still integral parts of getting um, good data sets. Now, you don't always have to have control. We do a lot of projects these days that are um, uh, inside buildings for uh, clearances where they just need to get measurements and they don't need to uh, connect to the real world on it. Um, and so we can get away then without having to put up uh, much control or, or, or any control. And even our mobile LiDAR system is pretty good at collecting um, reliable data sets without control. However, uh, it's much better if you have control set and the proper control set. And uh, so not only do you have to take into account of what type of control you want to use, whether it's an aerial project or mobile LiDAR project or a terrestrial project, um, but also the spacing on the control. And then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, getting the appropriate ground truthing uh, from land surveyors. That's always going to make your, your data uh, uh, superior data. And so I wanted to just highlight a recent project that we had completed. Um, and I think we're still working on a couple of pieces of it. Um, this is actually was in Oklahoma, uh, but we have an office up in Oklahoma. In fact, our geospatial director is based out of Oklahoma City. Um, and uh, this was a project where we happened to use um, pretty much all the forms of data collection that we're using right now at half. Um, so we combined mobile, terrestrial, um, aerial acquisition, and also conventional work uh, with the guys actually on the ground, land surveyors out there in, in traditional crews. So this was about for 10 and a half miles of rapid transit bus route um, going right down into Oklahoma City. Um, it included about 75 lane miles of collection and data extraction. Uh, by lane miles, what we refer to there is we might have to drive some of the road areas um, due to the width that they have or the number of lanes that they have more than once. We might have to go up the road one way and come back the other direction. Uh, in many instances, we don't have to do that. 
but a lot of times we do. And so that's what we refer to as the, as the lane mile. Um, and this particular project, we were able to use pavement markings for photo IDs for about 95% of the project. Um, I feel it's significant to mention that just because again, when you have to account for putting down less control, um, it can save a lot of time on a project. Um, and also keep uh, the survey crews safer um, if they're not having to go out there and get, you know, in, in this case, along a bus route, which is gonna be along uh, a, a dense urban environment where there's going to be a lot of traffic where you don't want to have to shut that down. Um, it's it's much more safer uh, to use photo ID in that case. Now, we don't prefer to do that in many instances, but it can be done uh, and if it's done appropriately. Um, so on this particular project, not only did we use mobile LIDAR, like I mentioned, but we used terrestrial LIDAR um, for some of the construction areas where we're going to have a lot of those barriers. Um, so we're going to have, you know, uh, a line of sight issues. Uh, but also for infrastructure areas. Uh, we also, we use the, uh, our drones for uh, uh, orthophotography of the area for, you know, uh, capturing some of those utility markings, but also for uh, planimetric feature data collection, uh, which is essentially just the hardscape, everything on the ground that you can see, including utility boxes, you know, manhole covers, valve covers, uh, electrical utility and cable utilities on the side of the road. Um, and then we had conventional crews out there as well. So a great example of what you can do with um, uh, all these different types of data collection to help you speed up the process of collecting that data and then processing it in a house. Some of the, the data sets that you get with this are the combined data sets or the data fusion that we pull out of this. Um, here's an example of some of the mobile LIDAR data with some of the imagery that was collected and some of the modeling that was done uh, for it. Again, some examples of that modeling uh, with the imagery that could, can be collected as still photos or as video. Again, we flew this project as well, so we'll have a, an aerial perspective of it. Um, on the right is just uh, the orthophotography, and then on the left is the orthophotography with some of the topographic features and some of the planimetric features overlaying on it. Um, so you'll see not only pavement markings like the left turn arrows and the pedestrian crossings, but also uh, we bring down the brake lines so that you can see differences in elevation uh, on the pavement. You know, many instances we're trying to get uh, clearances for power lines to go across roadways. And so it's important to know the height of the roadway as well as the, the minimum height of the lines that are uh, going across the roadway. You can also see some examples of the, 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 the data that we can collect for the trees underneath the canopy and then also some of the small utilities that were collected along the sides of the roadway there as well. And here's just another example of that with uh, some of the some of those uh, uh, planimetric features or line work features uh, overlaying on top of the, the modeling and the imagery um, and some of the tin work features as well. And so just to kind of summarize uh, a lot of what we've gone over, and, and I apologize for going over so much information so quickly, uh, but we've been talking about the benefits of geospatial uh, data uh, or data fusion here today, um, which again is just, you know, combining da data, data sets from different data collection methods. Um, we combine these data sets um, to provide for different perspectives, um, to get around, you know, obstacles that we may have, um, and just to get uh, uh, different observations um, that lend more information to the project that you have at hand. Um, data mining, I mentioned uh, early on, and I mentioned it twice here because it is a key uh, component that can be used with all different types of data collection when we're talking uh, geospatial data. Um, you can repurpose this data and use it for different types of projects that you have to save on not only the da data collection, but the processing costs that you would have with it. Uh, and then you, then you can go back and look at that data at a different time uh, to see differences and compare the data sets. And the introduction of AI software to, to, to packages is literally game changing. And it's really starting to, to, to affect the things that we do. We recently uh, were asked to provide some information for a project where they needed to do some impervious cover analysis for a water system um, so that they could tell how much water was, was runoff and how much of water was being absorbed into a particular lot or a specific lot. Uh, and what, you know, a lot of the uh, utilities use this information to set up their fees. So this is important information and being able to get very accurate information, uh, particularly when you have a fee structure that's gonna be implemented behind it. 
um, is, is integral. So it's always uh, best to have the best data that you can for projects like that. All right, as I said, I kind of went through things uh, quickly there. Uh, so wanted to give a little bit of time for questions uh, that we might have had. All right, thanks, Bill. That was really interesting. I I, I like the uh, the graphics that you shared with us. I think that's really really cool how how well you can you can map things these days with with all this technology. We do actually have a few questions from the audience, which is great. Uh, before I read the first one, I'll just say anybody in the audience that wants to ask a question, please go to the Q and A box now and go ahead and type that in. We'll we'll try to get to it. The first question is. Um, I have a question about incorporating a gyroscope in UAV LiDAR mounts, and what would be some advantages and disadvantages of the gyroscope mounts? Um, yeah, I would. I would probably would ask some further questions to that, like what to what end were they trying to do that? You know, most of the the systems that we're using now um, uh, account for that and have have that within them. Um, you know, if you're building something on your own, that might be something uh, that you'd want to look into to put it into it. Um, you know, when when a lot of this was getting started with drone and, and lidar data collection was was just becoming a uh, just coming around into existence. Um, I was working with some folks out in Southern California, and w uh, one of the students that I was working with on a project um, uh, had done some uh, um, research and development on using different types of sensors on on drones and that sort of thing even down to the point where he was using just a standard you know uh, uh, iphone um, strapped to a drone to do data collection um, he had a lot of issues with that because of, of the movement and not accounting for uh, what the drone's doing when it's actually doing its work you know it's not always completely still so um, yeah, I mean, most systems are accounting for stuff like that. But if you, you know, if you're building systems on your own, that's certainly something that you would uh, want to take into consideration so that you get the proper, uh, um, you know, calibration or uh, you get the the proper uh, influence on the, on your machinery. Thank you. And the person that asked that question, if you want to give a little bit more information, a uh, little bit of follow up, feel free to do that in the, in the question box. Uh, next question is, uh, what would you recommend for low-cost UAV LiDAR topographic data mines? Um, well, uh, I, I'm not sure if they're asking is what type of equipment that they would they they would need to use for it. You know, what kind of drone is the, is the most inexpensive? Um, uh, so from that perspective, you know, we have a number of different drones that we use now. Um, if we're just talking, you know, for photogrammetry, uh, the the DGI Phantom Fours uh, is something that we use. I know there's a lot of questions now around um, uh, foreign makers of drones, and uh, especially when it comes to the federal agencies, um, and even some local and regional agencies have been affected by this. Uh, but I think DGI is going to be in the market for a while. Although there are some great U.S. Uh, manufacturers of of drones that we're looking at um, that are that are maybe a little bit higher cost, uh, but hopefully they're going to be bringing costs down as more folks start to use them. Hopefully that answered that question. I'm not sure where he was uh, referring to for as far as the, the least expensive or the holding the cost down. OK, and again, if, if the uh, person who asked the question, if you want to kind of clarify a little bit, we can probably get to that towards the end. Um, let's see, uh, what is the difference what, is, what are the differences of LIDAR setups? 360 view versus vertical, horizontal, 90 degree view? Yeah, um, well, for example, what's what you see there in the picture to the right, that's a Leica RTC 360, and that's one of our uh, terrestrial based LIDAR scanners. Um, it gives you a full 360 view at this point. You know, when scanners first came out or when I first got involved in scanning, you know, back in, again, you know, mid 2000 there, um, a lot of them didn't do that. You maybe had a 100, 180 degree perspective. Um, if they did go full 360, um, you may not get um, any information uh, um, under you know an hour for the scan to do the full 360. Nowadays, this thing is doing it in right around a minute or under a minute, so it moves pretty quickly. Um, but most of the the high end scanners that are out there now are giving you a full 360 view of everything. And even on our mobile LiDAR system, we have a ladybug camera system on that. I think there's 
I might be off here by one camera. So I think there's six cameras that's on that. So it gives you a pretty full view, um, even with mobile systems too. Thank you. Um, does UAV control system stability affect LIDAR scans and performance? Uh, yeah, again, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to achieve as, as far as accuracies. Uh, but, you know, if you can have it controlled and controlled properly, properly you're going to get really good data. Um, there's a gentleman from Arizona named Jim Kroom, uh, who's a surveyor who's really gotten into uh, research and development on the all the different types of drones um, and the different camera sensors and everything that's involved with surveying and drones. But the one thing that Jim always goes back to is having your project properly controlled. And, and that's, that's where I'm at as a photogrammetrist as well. Um, if you don't have proper ground truthing and control for a project, you're just not going to get good results um, or you're going to get unreliable results. Gotcha. Uh, what do you recommend for software, to, for what software to use when building up for LiDAR image re resolution? That, you know, it's really going to depend on, again, whether you're talking on using, you know, um, an aerial system for acquisition, whether you're talking about a terrestrial system or mobile systems. There's so many different software packages right now um, that that's kind of a tough question to answer unless I know what the exact equipment that you're going to be using and then what you're going to be doing with the data, uh, you know, uh, where you're going to be putting it at. For a lot of the structural stuff that we're using, you know, um, when we're doing like uh, building facades, uh, it's just line work in CAD. Um, you know, with the drones, we're, we're using PIX4D. Uh, we're using any number of different software packages. Uh, and then when you get into, you know, aerial acquisition, there's all types of different software packages when it comes uh, to that. Uh, you know, everything from Hexagon to, to Summit to everything that's out there. So um, on, on that, you, you know, you want to um, look at the equipment that you're going to use. And then uh, where you're going to be giving that data or who's going to be getting that data from them and talk to them a little bit about their systems as well, because there's a lot of different software out there. Right now. Thank you. Um, that was the end of the student questions. I'll, I'll give some people some time to uh, perhaps ask a few more here, but I'm just curious, what's the, I mean, obviously there's a huge breadth of the types of, of stuff you're doing with this uh, photogrammetry and all these scans and stuff. So what are the things that you work with most often? What are you called on to do most often with this, with these tools and with your, in your career? Yeah, um, well, I mean, in my career, I've, I've, most of my career, I've been with a, a small photogrammetric firm. So most of that work was um, just with, the, from an aerial perspective. Um, I did some work, uh, uh, early in my career with some terrestrial scanning. Now that I've been with HAF for a little bit over a year here, um, you, know, you know, we're looking at geospatial as all the, the three types that I've talked about here today at least, and plus bathymetry as well, which we're getting into more and more. But we do a lot of uh, mobile LIDAR data collection. Uh, we do a lot of public agency work, in particular for TxDOT. Um, they supplement a lot of the aerial uh, data that they get with mobile LIDAR data. Uh, and then, you know, along a lot of the roadways, you're going to have overpasses or underpasses or bridges. You know, terrestrial scanning is good for that. So, I mean, we're really using all three of those on a regular basis for transportation projects. Um, the image that you have there again uh, in front of you is of some terrestrial scanning that we did for a commercial project. So we're getting more and more into building information modeling and working with, you know, structural engineers. Uh, MEP groups, uh, mechanical, uh, electrical, and plumbing groups, um, and architects. Um, we've done everything from, uh, you know, forensic analysis uh, of, of rooms, of walls, to see what's going on because they've been having equipment failures, um, to just going in and scanning uh, new buildings to have a, uh, an as-built uh, moving forward. Uh, or because they're going to be an installing equipment and we needed to go in there and check clearances for the equipment for them and scanning is a great way to do that. Um, so yeah, like, like you said there, Jeremy, we're finding new and different ways to use the technology. I mean, literally every day. Um, and so in conjunction with that, I'm out looking in, in business development for different types of clients that we can work with um, and different ways that we can use the technology because it's it's so easy and fast and inexpensive to collect the data now 
and to get such a large amount of data um, that you know this isn't going to go anywhere, but just but we keep increasing and keep increasing, and you know we'll see a point in time probably where even satellites are going to be collecting data for people. Right now in professional services, you know you need to have somebody that's at a land surveying firm or a civil engineering firm because a lot of this is locality, right? You know it's it's expensive to bring in equipment and manpower from a long way away, but it isn't from right down the street. Uh, and the advances in technology and the prices have been coming down on it uh, are making it affordable for a lot more people to get into in, into geospatial data collection. Um, and so one of the things that we also looked at in conjunction with that is, is education. We need to get um, the right students with the right skill sets. Um, you know, we do a lot of retraining of our survey, surveying techs to become geospatial techs because a lot of them haven't worked with point cloud data or LIDAR data. And so that's an issue, you know, going right down to the, the K through 12. Um, we need to talk to our schools about this technology and the careers that it's opening up for students um, in any number of ways that's kind of unlimited at this point. And that actually brings up an interesting point. How do you, what, what kind of training do you uh, need to become a geospatial um, engineer or geospatial tech? Like what, 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 if our students are, what, are, what are, let me start over. What should our students be looking to study if they're interested in this kind of field? Yeah, the nice thing about it is, is that, you know, they can come from any number of backgrounds. Now, you know, most, most students that are interested in this or traditionally that have been interested in this are going to come from, you know, GIS uh, or geography, uh, um, or you know, alternatively, um, because it's a data collection method and a way to to get information to people, uh, it's it's fallen right into land surveying. And you know, land surveying is a is a professional services industry that has been aging out for years. Um, so you know, just talking about land surveying, we need lots of people to to, to get into that. There's not a lot of land surveying programs at you know uh, four-year colleges. Um, there are at a lot uh, some of the other um, uh, you know uh, community colleges. Um, so you you don't necessarily have to have a four-year degree. But then there's a lot of um, four-year degree programs that are starting to introduce more of the geospatial services into their geography, or like I said, GIS programs. Uh, and so you you know you'll you'll be getting students from from all different sorts of backgrounds. You know I'm a great example of this. I have a, a, a Bachelor of Arts in English. Okay, I was going to teach. And at one point I, I got into business development and, and then I got into photogrammetric business development. Well, I realized right away that I didn't have the background for it. And so I was lucky enough to be with a firm that, that gave me some training right up front um, and taught me some things so that I knew you know, what they were talking about when they talked about photogrammetry and data processing. Um, but that that's not out there for a lot of people who have been looking for photogrammetry. Fortunately, we have the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, uh, which offers certification programs um, for everything from uh, you know lidar to UAV to GIS um, to being a certified uh, 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 you know photogrammetrist like myself. Um, and there's some state agencies um, that also you need to be licensed as as a photogrammetrist within the state. Um, not as widespread uh, as it's with land surveying, uh, not nearly. Uh, so, you know, there's a number of different ways to get into it, but you don't have to come from one particular area, but the, most folks come from the GIS or ge geography. Thanks, and we actually had a question from the audience. What do you think about the potential of geotechnical engineers being involved in the mainstream geospatial industry? Yeah, geotechnical engineers um, aren't, um, you know, the, the number one procurers of geospatial data, but they use it. And so what I see a lot of times is, is you know, um, those, those folks aren't coming to me to get that data, but whoever else has gotten that data from us is going to get them, get that to them at some point. Um, you know, alternatively, though, you know, as we look at different types of projects and we look to get different data sets, you know, we get asked to do you know, um, tree surveys more and more, which is kind of on the environmental side, but it's kind of merging because we have data that sometimes can collect that tree survey uh, uh, more efficiently than, you know, having to send folks out and, and do it on the ground. Um, but so I, I, I think all the different um, engineering uh, 
uh, disciplines, um, and maybe not every single one, but most of them are going to kind of see a way that they can connect into geospatial data somehow, some way. Um, the breadth is just, again, ever expanding. Interesting. Um, do you believe that geospatial data could be useful for Mars or space use? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, again, it, it, it's just different ways to collect data. So if you're needing to get land information, which is, you know, a real traditional use of photogrammetry, um, you can use geospatial, you know, because again, as far as we look at it as half geospatial, you know, extends from manned photogrammetry to drones to, to mobile LIDAR to terrestrial LIDAR, like I said, to bathymetry. Um, and who knows, there might be something else coming up, you know. Uh, there is land-based photogrammetry as well, which kind of figures in with the, the, the whole um, uh, scanning and building information model, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's I, I don't see a real limit on this. I mean, again, it's just a way to provide information more efficiently uh, and to get more information. Um, and as we figure out ways to do that better with, you know, different methods, um those are going to come in into play as well uh, but right now it's kind of just taking the, the 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 ways that we have to collect data and finding new uses for it because it's useful in any number of ways got it so <clears throat> excuse me does a, a photogrammetrist like do you go out are you like a one-stop shop you go out you collect all the data and then you come back in and crunch it yourself or do you just get a bunch of data and it's just a whole bunch of data points or whatever and then pass it off to data, data analysts somewhere else and they take care of it and, and figure it out? How does that work? Yeah, um, at, at half, um, we're doing all the processing in-house right now. Um, you know, in other firms I've been with, that's not necessarily the case, particularly with, uh, you know, aerial photogrammetric data. A lot of that sometimes is um, outsourced, um, but we, since we are surveyors and we already had the survey data that we're doing, the kind of progression we had was to move from the survey technicians to working with geospatial data because we were starting to use those, those kind of data collection methods and survey as well. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it can be done in-house um, and it can be done in-house inexpensively uh, as well. Uh, but a lot of times um, the information or the data collection is outsourced. And now at half, we have drones and we have the mobile LIDAR system and we have terrestrial scanners, so we collect that data on our own. For the manned acquisition, we have sub consultants that we use, um, depending upon the, the, the part of the country that we're working in, that will collect the data for us and then get us the data that we'll process then in-house. Got it. Um, I don't see any more questions, so we'll just give people a couple seconds to uh, ask any further questions they might have. Okay, great questions, by the way. Uh, they have been really good questions. I, I agree with you there. I, you know, it, it's really allowed you to kind of go into a little more detail on, on the kind of things you were trying to present to us today. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, it looks like we've uh, pretty much exhausted our, our audience's questions and stuff. So, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and we appreciate you taking the opportunity to share with us the kind of things that you're able to do with your uh, with your photogrammetry. I'm tripping over the word a little bit. But. <laughs> so uh, for the audience, thanks again for being here. Um, we do have these virtual brown bags scheduled every week uh, through the end of the semester. So go ahead and check the, the link at the top of the Q&A box to find out what that schedule is. And Bill, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you soon. You're welcome, thank you.